Okay, we're going to get going. Sorry for the delay. I was uh, too busy visiting here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ed Friedman, the chair of Friends of Miami Bay. And this is the, uh, I think, 16th year we've had this uh, speaker series going. This is the last event of this season. Already got a few people lined up for October. We do it October through May, the second Wednesday typically of each month. And uh, we mix it up around some of the different towns around the bay. And then we have about four sessions here in Brunswick, typically. Those of you that don't know, you know, we do research, we do advocacy work for the land trust, and we have an active education program. Um, thank Patagonia for donating this. It's tonight's door prize raffle <laughs> item, nice pile jacket. Our, uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Chris Buchanan, is a uh, field organizer for the uh, de organization Defending Water for Life in Maine. And uh, she's also organizing, or doing a lot of organizing around uh, Stop East-West Corridor. Um, Jim St. Pierre over here is also working on the East-West Corridor issue and was an earlier speaker this season. So Chris is going to mostly focus on water and water rights. And some of you may know there's some serious issues around that. Nestle owns Poland Spring now. There may be some other big companies involved. And uh, I think um, sort of the western foothill area at Freiburg area or Rangeley areas are particularly uh, involved in those issues. And Thank you very much. Give you that to oh, yeah. on some point. For the video camera. Well, thank you all very much for having me. Uh, that was a great introduction, Ed. I appreciate it. Um, it's a treat to come down to Brunswick and be back at this library. I've had some really nice times talking to small groups here. And I do encourage you to share your knowledge tonight as well with water issues. Um, as Ed said, this is my third year as an organizer. and. Um, I'm probably, I'm honest to a fault, so I will admit to you that not very long after I started organizing with Defending Water for Life in Maine, the East-West Corridor issue came up and I, I turned almost my full attention to that as a long-term a long water grab uh, of the state of Maine and have been coordinating the statewide coalition, as Ed said, Stop the East-West Corridor. Um, so. I can speak on that extensively, but please deal, uh, put up with my um, trippings on actually giving a full water presentation because this is um, not something that I do very often and certainly haven't done in a long time. So I'll tell you a little bit about Defending Water for Life in Maine. Uh, I'm the only organizer with Defending Water for Life in Maine at this time. Uh, we're a project of the Alliance for Democracy. And we approach water issues mostly around rights. Who has the right to water? What happens when water is privatized and controlled by a private transnational corporation like Nestle, who owns Poland Spring? Uh, we think that there's serious problems with community access and people's rights because water is something that we all need to live for life. Um, so like air, if we commodified it, we limit access to some people and allow others to profit off of it. Um, and that seems like an inherent issue for both democracy in general for us um, and also uh, the impact to human rights and also the rights of nature. Um, nature also needs water to thrive and survive and be abundant and give us the life that we need. So um, once it's you know, controlled for profit again, the bottom line isn't necessarily about people or about that natural system. The bottom line is making money, and we see a conflict in that. Uh, so we work with towns who are facing water extraction issues. Um, if, you know, somebody is worried that um, a company wants to come in and privatize their water, we'll work with the town to try to develop uh, protections against that. Um, we also do, we serve as a watchdog, so we'll keep an eye on small towns across the state um, and provide resources. Um, and we also will 
speak on water issues in Augusta if uh, something like the bottle bill or uh, any bottled water bills come up. Um, we're usually there to um, try to try to talk to legislators about why it's important for them to kick bottled water and um, no longer support Nestle as much as they do. Nestle has a real serious stronghold in our state capital. So I'm going to continue on here. Um, we are in a serious global water crisis. Um, it was a couple years ago that the United Nations actually published that one in every six people lacks access to clean drinking water. Um, and since then has declared water a human right. Um, in this picture, you know, you see folks wading through trash. Uh, the wa bottled water um, and other plastic bottles. And one of the other pieces of the global water crisis isn't just that the world actually has a very small percentage of drinking water, but also that we're polluting it at an alarming rate. Our desire as a global culture for fossil fuels, um, plastics, a lot of our consumptive tendencies are um, polluting water very rapidly, and that makes water more expensive than something like oil or gas or um, even uh, precious minerals. And it's been called by Maud Barlow, blue gold, because it's something that we all need. Um, so while water is becoming scarcer, it's also becoming much more valuable and therefore is targeted by a corporation like Nestle as the most, um, the wisest investment that they could make financially because whoever controls the water is going, contr going to control power worldwide. I'm gonna just touch on the environmental impacts of bottled water, but I'm not gonna go too deeply here because I'm sure that you have all put some thought into this. Um, there is toxicity in the production of bottles from pollution of groundwater to air emissions to um, you know, human impact, animal impact. Um, we know that um, people have, um, or or animals have actually contained toxins from plastics that's also been proven now in people, um, that there's toxins from actually consuming um, uh, goods and water and other liquids out of plastics. So that's, plastics aren't safe, basically. Um, the transportation of water and bottles is extremely environmentally impactful. Um, burning fossil fuels to move water around doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think about how, you know, a really long time ago, if you can think way back, the fresh water was all potable. You know, at one point, we were able to drink the water that was where we lived. And how far we've come from that, it just blows my mind and is sad. Um, there's the plastic bottle waste stream. Um, although in Maine, we do have an active bottle bill and a lot of bottles are recycled. Um, in other parts of the country, the recycling rate is very low. And something that a lot of people don't know is that all plastic actually gets downcycled. So it doesn't become another plastic water bottle. It could become carpeting or something else. And eventually, it will end up as trash in an ocean or in a landfill. Um, there's only so much recycling that you can do, and there's only so long that plastic holds up. So uh, that's, that's another big thing, the amount of plastic in the oceans, and um, it's appalling, but I don't have those statistics. Um, extraction, the damage to aquifers. Um, we have a, our state geologist, Robert Marvini, um, is really pro water extraction. Um, he's been very supportive of Nestle using Maine's water and making jobs out of it. Um, but unfortunately, there is damage to aquifers that occurs from overpumping. Um, it's not necessarily something that we're seeing in Maine right now as an urgent problem, but we have some of the best water in the world. 
So as it becomes more valuable, and as companies like Nestle move in more, what's going to happen if they're continuing to try to meet their bottom line? Um, so we're concerned about the long-term impacts. And we also do know that overpumping um, in areas close to the coast, for example, um, risk saltwater intrusion and collapse. Um, I can't verify this, but we heard from somebody in Hollis whose foundation actually started to subside um, because of overpumping of the aquifer there. Um, and then the overall impact on the ecosystem in general, um, we kind of talked about that. One of the things that's so beautiful and amazing about water, in my opinion, um, is that it, it's so fluid. It takes on everything that it goes by, whether it's good, whether it's bad, you know, whether it's poisonous or healthful, um, it takes it on. So it's very, very hard to trace scientifically how you're impacting an area by extracting water. Because you know, Nestle, for example, could point to the farmer and say, well, that guy's using this much water. There's you know, 500 residents in town. They're all using different amounts of water. How do you know that it's us? And that's a good question. You know, how do we? It's really hard to tell. The rainfall rates change every year. Um, and we certainly know that as the climate is changing um, and overall the world is getting drier, um, we don't really have an accurate precedent to know how things are going to be moving forward. So um, keeping that in mind. The social impacts. Um, as I mentioned, there are human health risks to drinking bottled water. Um, bottled water is actually only regulated by half of one person at the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> Your municipal water, if our, our folks here do you guys have wells, or are you on a public water system? Do you know? Public water system well, OK. I personally, I have a well. But the public water systems are tested monthly, if not weekly. Um, somebody else might know that better than me. I'll admit. <laughs> I'll tell you when I don't know something. <laughs> um, but they're tested regularly. And um, the bottled water is not, and it's not required to be. Um, in the state of Maine, we have regulations where they have to test the wells monthly and send that in, the water levels. Um, but in terms of what you are consuming, um, there has been a lot of studies done that find that bottled water is not cleaner than your tap water. Um, and in fact, you're at much higher risk of picking up some sort of bacteria from drinking bottled water than public water, which is exactly opposite the propaganda that they're trying to sell, that you know, tap water should be for washing and bathing and um, bottled water should be for drinking. Total, total farce. Um, OK, the rights to water. Who has the power? Something we started talking about earlier, and I'm going to come back to in a minute. Um, but. That's, that's, that's the key piece for us at Defending Water for Life. Who has the right, who has the power, and who should have that power? Should it be your community? Should it be you, know, you and your family and your neighbors? Or should it be somebody who is trying to make money off of that um, resource? And the last thing is just investing your money wisely. Um, that's not where I'm going. I'll go here for a second. Um, we know for a fact that they're taking water out mostly for free um, and selling it oftentimes at a thousand times the cost of your tap water. Um, so in terms of you know, an investment at your local business, if you have a little jug of Poland spring water that you're taking, or if you're using tap water, you're going to save way more money in the long term using tap water and also contributing to advocating for your town to maintain your public water infrastructure, because that benefits all of you for the long, the long haul. OK, coming back up. I'm going to play this short video um, because it uh, may be a little bit of a cop out, but it's definitely an excellent 
cartoon that I think portrays the issues um, around bottled water really effectively. So you'll get a break from me talking. Oops. This is a story about a world obsessed with stuff. It's a story about a... Sorry. It's going to come on here in a minute. So when we start to understand the system, we start to see lots of places to step in and turn these problems into solutions. Is that loud enough? One of the problems with trying to use less yeah. stuff is that sometimes we feel like we really need it. What if you live in a city like, say, Cleveland, and you want a glass of water? Are you going to take your chances and get it from the city tap? Or should you reach for a bottle of water that comes from the pristine rainforest of Fiji? Well, Fiji brand water thought the answer to this question was obvious, so they built a whole ad campaign around it. It turned out to be one of the dumbest moves in advertising history. You see, the city of Cleveland didn't like being the butt of Fiji's jokes, so they did some tests, and guess what? These tests showed a glass of Fiji water is lower quality, it loses taste tests against Cleveland tap, and costs thousands of times more. This story is typical of what happens when you test bottled water against tap water. Is it cleaner? Sometimes, sometimes not. In many ways, bottled water is less regulated than tap. Is it tastier? In taste tests across the country, people consistently choose tap over bottled water. These bottled water companies say they're just meeting consumer demand. But who would demand a less sustainable, less tasty, way more expensive product, especially one you can get for almost free in your kitchen? Bottled water costs about 2,000 times more than tap water. Can you imagine paying 2,000 times the price of anything else? How about a $10,000 sandwich? Yet people in the U.S. buy more than half a billion bottles of water every week. That is enough to circle the globe more than five times. How did this come to be? Well, it all goes back to how our materials economy works and one of its key drivers, which is known as manufactured demand. If companies want to keep growing, they have to keep selling more and more stuff. In the 1970s, giant soft drink companies got worried as they saw their growth projections starting to level off. There's only so much soda a person can drink. Plus, it wouldn't be long before people began realizing that soda is not that healthy and turned back to, gasp, drinking tap water. Well, the companies found their next big idea in a silly designer product that most people laughed off as a passing yuppie fad. Water is free, people said back then. What will they sell us next? Air? So how do you get people to buy this fringe product? Simple. You manufacture demand. How do you do that? Well, imagine you're in charge of a bottled water company. Since people aren't lining up to trade their hard-earned money for your unnecessary product, you make them feel scared and insecure if they don't have it. And that's exactly what the bottled water industry did. One of their first marketing tactics was to scare people about tap water with ads like Fiji's Cleveland campaign. When we're done, one top water executive said, tap water will be relegated to showers and washing dishes. Next, you hide the reality of your product behind images of pure fantasy. Have you ever noticed how bottled water tries to seduce us with pictures of mountain streams and pristine nature? But guess where a third of all bottled water in the US actually comes from? The tap. Pepsi's Aquafina and Coke's Dasani are two of the many brands that are really filtered tap water. But the pristine nature lie goes much deeper. In a recent full page ad, Nestle said, bottled water is the most environmentally responsible consumer product in the world. What? They are trashing the environment all along the product's life cycle. Exactly how is that environmentally responsible? The problems start here with extraction and production where oil is used to make water bottles. Each year, making the plastic water bottles used in the US takes enough oil and energy to fuel a million cars. All that energy is spent to make the bottle, even more to ship it around the planet, and then we drink it in about two minutes? That brings us into the big problem at the other end of the life cycle, disposal. What happens to all these bottles when we're done? 80% end up in landfills, where they will sit for thousands of years, or in incinerators where they are burned, releasing toxic pollution. The rest gets collected for recycling. I was curious about where the plastic bottles that I put in the recycling bins go. 
I found out that shiploads were being sent to India, so I went there. I will never forget riding over a hill outside Madras where I came face to face with a mountain of plastic bottles from California. The real recycling would turn these bottles back into bottles. But that wasn't what was happening here. Instead, these bottles were slated to be downcycled, which means turning them into lower quality products that would just be chucked later. The parts that couldn't be downcycled were thrown away there, shipped all the way to India just to be dumped in someone else's backyard. If bottled water companies want to use mountains on their labels, it would be more accurate to show one of these mountains of plastic waste. Scaring us, seducing us, and misleading us, these strategies are all core parts of manufacturing demand. Once they've manufactured all this demand, creating a new multi-billion dollar market, they defend it by beating out the competition. But in this case, the competition is our basic human right to clean, safe drinking water. Pepsi's vice chairman publicly said, the biggest enemy is tap water. They want us to think it's dirty and bottled water is the best alternative. In many places, public water is polluted thanks to polluting industries like the plastic bottle industry. And these bottled water guys are all too happy to offer their expensive solutions, which keep us hooked on their products. It is time we took back the tap. That starts with making a personal commitment to not buy or drink bottled water unless the water in your community is truly unhealthy. Yes, it takes a bit of foresight to grab a reusable bottle on the way out, but I think we can handle it. Then take the next step. Join a campaign that's working for real solutions, like demanding investment in clean tap water for all. In the US, tap water is underfunded by $24 billion, partly because people believe drinking water only comes from a bottle. Around the world, a billion people don't have access to clean water right now. Yet cities all over are spending millions of dollars to deal with all the plastic bottles we throw out. What if that money was spent improving our water systems, or better yet, preventing pollution to begin with? There are many more things we can do to solve this problem. Lobby your city officials to bring back drinking fountains. Work to ban the purchase of bottled water by your school, your organization, or entire city. This is a huge opportunity for millions of people to wake up and protect our wallets, our health, and the planet. The good news is it's already started. Bottled water sales have begun to drop while business is booming for safe, refillable water bottles. Yay! Restaurants are proudly serving tap, and people are choosing to pocket the hundreds or thousands of dollars they would otherwise be wasting on bottled water. Carrying bottled water is on its way to being as cool as smoking while pregnant. We know better now. The bottled water industry is getting worried because the jig is up. We are not buying into their manufactured demand anymore. We will choose our own demands, thank you very much, and we're demanding clean, safe water for all. Stuff project is really cool. It's a it's a really neat way that they've decided to creatively show um, several different issues. There's oh, oh boy, there's other um, story of stuff movies as well, and you can download that for free on the internet um, and look at some of their other videos. So um, I think that that made it pretty clear in a nutshell what the issues with bottled water are. And I, I also want to speak for a minute on Nestle's bottom line. Here in Maine, Nestle's argument is that they're providing jobs. You know, they're using an abundant resource to give people good jobs. They're being respectful to our environment and they're a good neighbor. We disagree. <laughs> Um, for some of the reasons that you saw outlined there. You know, one of their environmental arguments that they are so proud of is that they're making a, a very thin plastic water bottle now, so they're using less plastic, and that's supposed to be more appealing to us, which, you know, I think of as a joke, but they think that that's um, really an improvement in, in what they're doing. But this is some examples of Nestle not being such a good neighbor. Um, 
not only in Maine, but also in Michigan. And the list goes on and on. And this I'm targeting specifically Nestle Waters North America. Um, if you look at Nestle Food Corporation, you'll see an endless list um, back to when they were providing um, contaminated um, baby formula um, and their horrible history of human rights abuses around their chocolate and coffee products. Um, I'm sure maybe you've heard of Nescafe and Nesquik and that's all Nestle. Um, so in March 2009, Nestle Waters North America sued the town of Freiburg. Um, Nestle has been pumping water out of Freiburg for several years now. They reached an agreement with the privately owned water utility to own a couple wells in Freiburg. So Nestle has the spring water wells and the public actually had to drill a third well, which is not actually a spring water well, to supply their municipal um, consumers. So Nestle wanted to build a pumping um, station in Freiburg, and it was resisted by the residents. When Nestle came in in the first place, it divided the community, um, and people that used to be friends for ever were no longer speaking to each other, which is one of the major problems with any large corporation coming into a community. But this issue in 2009 kind of tipped, tipped the iceberg. Um, so Nestle sued the town of Freiburg and said, um, you know, the town of Freiburg said, no, you cannot build this pumping station. And Nestle said, actually, your comprehensive plan doesn't prevent us from building a pump pumping station because it's not um, like a regulatory ordinance. So we are going to build our pumping station. Um, and Nestle won. So they did build their pumping station in the town of Freiburg. Um, and the town was left to just regulate, you know, how many trucks could come or go. Um, Nestle also had an issue with the town of Denmark, where they wanted to build a pumping station in Denmark, and Denmark didn't let them, so instead they just built a water pipe into Freiburg, where they now take the water out of. Um, in October 2011, Nestle um, countered Macosta County, Michigan residents um, who were trying to protect their water from being taken by Nestle, and Nestle won. There was several lawsuits in Michigan that went back and forth, um, but at the end of the day, Nestle has pretty much infinite resources when compared to a citizens group or a town. Um, so inviting Nestle into any community is inviting a um, David and Goliath kind of a situation, um, which is also the problem with the East-West Corridor Project. One of the main problems of the East-West Corridor Project um, is that it, it could be owned and most likely would be owned if it ever happened by transnational corporations, um, transnational investors, and all of the towns along the way, or any even the state of Maine, having future negotiations with that corporation um, would be dealing with somebody or some entity that has so many more resources than they do. So it's, I think, very important to be aware of that. Um, March 10th, 2013, um, this is just to touch on the current situation in Freiburg, which honestly I haven't been as aware of as other organizers. Um, Nisha Swinton from Food and Water Watch is one of the primary organizers um, in Freiburg at this time, as well as a local um, person on the ground with a group called Community Water Justice. Her name is Nikki Sakara, and her son Luke has made headlines worldwide um, because on March 10th, Nestle was trying to extend, extend their contract in Freiburg to 45 years um, of controlling the water there. Um, and it wouldn't be until Luke was 55 until he got a chance to vote on whether or not Nestle should be taking the water. So he did a, he did a really beautiful um, speech at the PUC hearing. Um, that's the Public Utilities Commission where they were trying to decide whether Nestle should 
have that contract or not, and they're currently in negotiations, but it was an overwhelming public opposition to Nestle in the community that, that day. Um, and then on April 17th of 2013, so very recently, um, Peter Brabeck, who's the chief CEO of Nestle um, in headquarters out in Sweden, he said, Switzerland, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> he said, water is not a human right. Um, and he refers to water as a foodstuff and a commodity that needs to be controlled by the private sector just like any food. Um, so for us, that's really outrageous. Um, but I think for somebody that's looking to make a lot of money off of it, that makes perfect sense to just compare it to other food. So we've talked about this, um, and I can't help but include this cartoon in there because the East-West Corridor is this potential um, you know, transnational land grab, as I mentioned, um, but it's the same sort of exploitive deal, and this image really captures all the potential exploitation of our natural resources, our local jobs, our small businesses, um, the markets that we need to thrive and survive, um, and our profits for more big box stores, transnational corporate control, and more money leaving and going elsewhere. Um, and I know I saw Jim's presentation on the East-West Corridor that he did here, and I saw that he, he focused a lot on globalization. Um, it's not working out for us. Um, and I'm personally, as a, as a young person, really disenfranchised, disenfranchised, disenchanted, excuse me, to hear my politicians in Augusta just say, well, we're broke, so I guess we have to do public-private partnerships, or I guess we have to let these big businesses run us over because we're broke. You know, it's, we need to look at what we've done to get to this place. And what we've done, in my opinion, is increased our global access and sent our money and our jobs, our resources away with a lot of disregard to our natural resources. Um, Maine is a, such a special place, as all of you know. Um, and what makes us special and makes us unique is how beautiful it is here. The kind, we have so many resources to live off of here, um, and the people are amazing. I mean, some of the most hardworking, dedicated people I've ever met. Lots of them have lived here for hundreds of years. Some of our native people have lived here for 10,000 years and not had a problem like this. So I think it's important for us to look at the bigger picture. Um, so here's some suggestions of things that you can do. Um, you know, stop buying bottled water is a really good first step. Um, and who in here is familiar with 350 Maine? A couple people. 350.org is a worldwide organization at this point that's looking to raise awareness about climate change um, and try to look at alternatives to fossil fuel usage um, so that we do not reach the critical point w which we've we're, we're surpassing um, that our climate can't recover from and we're facing mass extinction um, of people and animals and life as we know it. So 350 is trying to raise awareness that we need to stop consuming fossil fuels at that rate, otherwise we're facing that kind of massive extinction um, potentially within the next 30 years as some of the closer estimates. It's really extreme and very terrifying, which is why a lot of people my age aren't even having kids anymore, um, which is an indicator of social health, I think. So um, they are doing a very good job divesting, having students be active in divesting uh, their colleges from fossil fuel companies. So I'm bringing up you know, your power as a consumer and the power of all of us as consumers to say, well, we're not gonna buy it. You can't have our money if those are the choices you're gonna make. We actually have a lot of power that way. So you can use pitchers of water instead of bottled water. Um, you know, advocate locally for your restaurants to use tap water, their local water. Um, 
you know, largely just spreading the word and doing educational things in your community. Um, there's a few movies that are out that are really good, Tapped, Thirst, and recently Bottled Life, which was actually done by a Swiss production company um, and aired some, it was in, within the last year that they did their premiere here in North Conway, um, which is excellent and also highlights some of the work that people have done locally to fight Nestle. Um, watch for disguised marketing and then reduce, reuse, but then recycle what's left. Um, and then our next step action items are digging a little deeper. And one of them is make the right to water a local law. So Defending Water for Life has worked to talk about and spread the word on what's called rights-based laws. Rights-based laws assert in your community that you have the right to your health, safety, and welfare, that that's more important as for you and your community than a company's right to go and take your water or dump sewage sludge on your fields or put an east-west corridor through. In our law today, those activities are all permitted. There's no legal avenue to actually just say no. If somebody wants to do something in your community, they don't come up to you and say, hey, what do you think about you know, us building the east-west corridor across the state? Do you think that's a good idea? And if the community says, no, we really don't think that's a good idea, they leave. That's not how it works. They get permits, um, which are basically permission, that's, that's what they are, from the state to do their project in your community. It's a little complicated, but I'm gonna try to explain it simply enough, and that is, in 1819, the Supreme Court of the United States made a decision um, in the Dartmouth College case where they gave Dartmouth College the rights to have a contractual agreement with the state. So that was essentially a private corporation being chartered by the state, that was their traditional relationship. Now it's being called a contract and that puts the state and that corporation on equal footing, okay? At that time, they also distinguished between the municipal corporation and that private corporation. Before corporations were corporations, they were all one thing and they were subordinate to the state and they needed a charter to operate. So at this point, we have the municipal corporation remaining subordinate, like the child to the state, but that private corporation having an equal relationship. And that's one of many cases that since then has given corporations the right to dump on our communities without us being able to actually say no. We can regulate how many trucks, how tall the fence is, how bright the lights are, if they're on at night or off at night, but we can't say no. So what these rights-based laws do is they say, that's not working out for us. We do have the right to protect our fundamental rights um, and we're going to assert that locally. So they prohibit a specific action, whether it's groundwater extraction or an unsustainable infrastructure project like the east-west corridor or industrial wind turbines or whatever it is. Um, they prohibit that and then they assert your rights in your community to protect yourselves. So that's one thing that we advocate for. It's really revolutionary. It's a, it's a civil rights law. Um, and it also drives the rights of nature into local law. And we're hoping to do this also on the county level to protect unorganized territories who currently have really no recourse, um, especially since Lurk was gutted by this governor last year. So um, the other thing to do would be to advocate for stricter groundwater laws. The state of Maine has one of the worst groundwater protection laws in the country, along with Texas. It's the law of the biggest pump. Whoever has the biggest pump can pump the most water. Um, and that doesn't really protect us very well. And 
to work to ensure affordable access to quality water, advocate for water infrastructure, encourage public fountains and taps in Maine. A lot of our springs were capped, um, which is something you know locally that people can really get behind is uncapping those springs so people have access to that spring water again. Uh, what a lot of towns do is just put a sign that says this water hasn't been tested. Um, but at least it allows people to uh, make that choice to test it themselves and have access to that water. Um, and then to protect our bottle bill, which seems to every once in a while be attacked like it was last year. Um, this image <laughs> I just threw in there because um, I think it's important for us to dream big. I think that it's important for us to keep close to our hearts what's important for us about Maine and why we live here and what we love and what we want for ourselves and for our kids and for our grandchildren. And um, right now, it seems to be going in this direction, welcome to Maine, anything for money. Um, and that's not what we're all about. And that's not why I live here. And that's definitely not the kind of state that I want to raise my kids in. So. That's all. You can contact me at chris at defendingwater.net. My phone number is also below. Um, the defendingwater.net site has a lot about Nestle that I wasn't able to touch on today, um, and also about rights-based law. And then stopthecorridor.org is pretty much everything that you're looking for about the East-West Corridor project, um, studies, what the coalition is doing, um, and how to get in touch with us at Stop the East West Corridor Coalition. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Just today, so we moved back. Yep, and you said the name of that was Witch Spring? Does anybody here know about Witch Spring and if it's still open or not? Yeah. I don't know about that, but I can tell you where somebody should. Uh, I'll pass this around. So. Where, where you should look. I know it we need to And where State Road in Bath, which is the old Bath Road as you come into Brunswick. But when you're in the Bath area, it's called State Road. The one for the road that Stones is on, you probably may be yes, asking for Shortly after you leave the roundabout, yes. uh, there is a turn on to Berry's Mill Road, and Witch Springs Road is somewhere up behind that. Yes. But I have never found a section of road that is actually called that, so I wondered if the name of it had been changed. But being new here, I don't know that. The Witch Spring was opposite there. It, it was right on that's the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I got all my water there. Okay, you can know. see. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's what you get. You get a, an ice cream place, but no longer uh, your ability to fill up jugs. And when I moved to Maine, I also didn't have running water and would just fill up jugs um, at the local spring, which the, is still open out in Albany, Maine, where I lived. So, other questions? I, Kathleen, I saw your hand. Yeah. Can I give you the mic? Sure. Um, I'm trying to frame the question so that it makes some sense, but with with all the water extraction and all the problems, with clearly the courts favor industry, um, both because they have deep pockets and they can get to court better than we can. But also, how, how are you finding, uh, both with the East-West Corridor as things progress, uh, if they progress far enough, that the trade agreements like NAFTA, GATT, TPP, how are they impacting your work with uh, water extraction and how do you see that? Uh, impact Maine um, in the next year or more? Thanks, that's a really great question. Um, the trade agreements are really critical. A lot of the work that we do um, is actually on the trade agreements. It's frustrating work because um, the trade agreements are so secretive and influencing them even for our state legislators um, and even our um, U.S. 
Congress people is very frustrating and challenging. Um, so Maine is definitely a gateway of one way or another. They want to come through here for all of their development, corridor, conduit needs. Um, and in this age, since NAFTA, but also now that they're negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and Obama is in favor of fast-tracking that, which is very dangerous, because we've seen what NAFTA has done to our economy and our uh, sovereignty. Um, I think that we're in a position where issues around resource extraction um, and even labor rights um, could be settled in international tribunals as determined by those free trade agreements as opposed to being settled you know, either in our local courts or our federal courts. Um, so there's a tremendous lack of control, loss of control already, but potentially more loss of control as more trade agreements are passed. Um, I don't think that in Maine we've been sued yet for loss of profits, but that's what the trade agreement set us up for is um, future lost profits can be you know, claimed by a corporation that's being prevented from extracting that water or building the east-west corridor and facilitating the transportation of their oil or whatever the case might be. Um, the east-west corridor is, is incredibly sensitive for that that issue because it links Canada to Canada um, and would be owned you know, by a private entity. So who would control that and what kind of law would apply is nobody knows. It's totally unprecedented in this country. Um, and we do know that, I don't know if folks saw this article, but there was um, a huge bicycle tour coming from Canada that wanted to come and recreate in Maine and bicycle through Maine and spend their money here. Um, and they were turned down at the border. And the title of the, the article said, bicyclists turned down because of NAFTA. And it was because they, they wouldn't allow that many people to cross the border as part of one entity at, at once. Um, so we're already seeing the ramifications of it. Yeah, it was crazy. It was. Um, it was like probably a month ago now, maybe a month and a half ago now. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's a really big point. So has, has Nestle done that in any other states undermine the community? Not that I am aware of. Has, is anybody else aware of that at this point? No. No. I do know that a company from the Philippines, though, sued the United States for our tobacco regulations because we don't allow underage minors to smoke. So that prevented them from uh, their profits of selling tobacco to minors. And we either then are in a position of changing the law or paying the fine. And the tribunal fi uh, did find in favor of that Philippine company. So we had to pay that fine because we don't allow minors to smoke. And that's, that's how ridiculous it is. Um, and it's really concerning in terms of what kind of control we actually have. So, so the, the, the fine got us off, though? I guess I, mean, I haven't heard that we're now selling to minors. So. Right. No, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we paid them. Okay. So, it wasn't a one-shot deal. It was a, you can pay this money and keep your lock. Yeah, that's right. And the, the TPP, um, for folks who don't know about it, um, we are trying to raise a lot of awareness about it. I also sit on the um, Maine Fair Trade campaign. And that's something we're trying to raise a lot of awareness around because the TPP would be with over 20 other countries, um, including um, actually Vietnam and um, Japan. Um, and there's, there's a lot of more, con Australia, there's other countries trying to get in on it. But for Maine, we're particularly concerned about the impact to seafood the safety of our seafood and seafood prices and our market just totally being blown away by competing with other countries that don't have the same kind of standards of seafood as we do, and then also our shoe manufacturing in particular. Vietnam makes a lot of shoes, pretty cheap too.
Is China part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? No, no, but it's it's been called by people I've talked to as a back door to China. We're talking about resource extraction with the water, mm -hmm. um, how communities uh, could possibly be impacted by the end by the East Coast Corridor. Jim did a great job when he was here before, but I think some people weren't here. But I think it's really important to talk about what um, uh, some of the resource extraction problems could be along that corridor, what, we, what we're guessing at anyway, because we I think we don't know exactly. How that's going to impact communities? Right. The, well, the potential for resource extraction is endless. If you think about whatever any, you know, all the resources that Maine has, which do include rare earth metals, the pristine water. We're right in the middle of fracking leases in Quebec and New Brunswick, so that's uh, a natural gas conduit. Um, we are a Atlantic port and um, companies producing both tar sands oil, but also um, just crude oil in general, um, are desperately trying to get it to the East Coast. Um, right now, it's bottlenecked in Montreal, and there's several companies competing. So even if they go up and around and to St. John's just through Canada, which is what TransCanada is now presenting that they would like to do, that still leaves this corridor route for other companies that would like to get their share of the tar sands oil to the Atlantic Ocean um, and sell it elsewhere around the world. So not only, um, oh, in addition to that, um, there's um, conveniently the Juniper Ridge Landfill, um, which is a huge giant uh, privately owned um, landfill uh, in Old Town. They're currently looking at an expansion but they, one of the big fights right now is that they're taking out-of-state waste. So would Maine be in a position to take fracking waste or mining waste or um, you know, any other kind of poisonous substances um, that is created elsewhere so that Casella can make money by putting them in their landfill? Um, so that's one specific community impact. Um, and then there's uh, the fact that there are proposed mining sites um, Bald Mountain, uh, I don't know if anybody has been following the mining regulations, but um, the state opened up the uh, main to have open pit mining, um, which is incredibly toxic. So that could lead to poisoning watersheds in areas like our last native trout habitat, for example, in areas that just currently are very pristine. Um, and just the, the transfer of any of those materials along pipelines, what would happen if they burst? You know, we've seen that recently in the news, how it's impacted those communities to deal with these massive spills, um, and they create dead zones. Um, so aside from the David and Goliath, um, there's that massive resource extraction piece and poisoning waters piece and our animals and on and on, um, as well as the wood products. I haven't even mentioned that, but um, torrified wood pellets are very popular in Europe. They're trying to get up to 20% renewable energy um, in Europe, so there's a huge demand for wood pellets. Um, so, you know, our natural resources like our wood, our gravel, um, I know that I'm missing something, but could just be sold to Europe quickly. Yeah, and then what are we going to do? <laughs> um, so that, that, that spills into the long-term economic viability of our communities. Um, the other thing that is happening or the corridor could facilitate would be the industrial wind development. And I know industrial wind is kind of controversial. Um, I'm totally against industrial wind developments. Um, it's, it's not a sustainable form of energy and it's costing us our mountaintops um, and our you know, way of life in those rural areas um, for very little gain. The only thing that makes them um, economic is that they're receiving federal tax credits, those companies that are developing them. And it's actually TransCanada who is one of the major developers. So they're, they're trying to green their image. 
but the corridor could facilitate industrial wind development as well, um, which, take it another step further, opens up areas that have currently not had roads in them to be subdivided in the future. Because um, once you build a road to access the wind turbines, then all of a sudden it's no longer pristine. It's much easier to get a permit to build on it and subdivide it. And um, it's, it's all a very slippery slope, unfortunately. Did I answer your question? Yes. Question. Just, just one more question. Um, uh, does defending water for life work on um, the fracking issues in, in, in regard to the water extraction and the polluting of that water? And, and uh, what, are you, what are you doing about that if you are? Defending water for life does not currently work on fracking. And it's, it's mostly because there's not fracking happening in Maine at this time. Um, we do post articles on fracking on our website, and I personally um, work with other groups that are working on fracking. Um, we did an action last summer that shut down a uh, drill rig in Pennsylvania, um, and I um, think that direct action to bring awareness to the extremities of all of this industrial um, wasting and exploitation of our people and our natural resources might be where we're at again because nothing else seems to be working. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the rights-based law. It's because it's, it's legal, it's a civil rights, um, well, it's, it's legal and illegal, but it's a civil rights law that we need to have to drive our rights back into the Constitution. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Let's pick a winner here. Oh, great. I get to do the fun part. Yeah. Charlotte. Charlotte Hart. Oh. There you go. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.